It's time for worship here at Stephen Green Baptist Church in Winsboro, and we're so glad that you've joined us. Now, you may already be able to tell that things are a little bit different today. In fact, things are a lot different today in terms of decorations and backgrounds here in the sanctuary, because later today, this evening, our Vacation Bible School begins, one of the great highlights of the year, as well as the summer. And so you'll be seeing those decorations in the background as we worship the Lord. But today, we're going to be focusing on the Bible itself and how important it is. We're going to see, for example, that according to what the Scriptures say about themselves, the Bible is unique and authoritative, and it has the power to change lives. And I hope that you have let the truth of God's Word already change your life by responding to its message and putting your faith in Jesus Christ as the Bible teaches. So again, welcome, thank you for joining us, and may God speak to you as we worship together. Let's go now into our worship time together. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for this time that brings us together for fellowship and worship in your house. And we know that you have a purpose in our being here. This is not just another event on our weekly or daily calendar. But Father, this is a time when we meet you. And we thank you today for Jesus, who is the reason for our gathering. Thank you for the hope and eternal life that we have through him. Speak to us now as we wait together in worship, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. It is that very special time of the year again. Vacation Bible School truly is the highlight of the summer here for us as a church family. In recent years, we have had such outstanding, meaningful, and wonderful experiences. We have had large attendance and participation from our community. We have seen lives touched and changed by what happened here during the days of Vacation Bible School. We're indebted to Kit Burroughs, our VBS director, and the wonderful large team of dedicated workers that she has. We're so grateful to all of you. Thank you for your faithfulness and your commitment and your dedication. 
And before we kick off Vacation Bible School officially at 6 o'clock this evening, as always, it's appropriate for us to have a time of commissioning and dedication of those who are working in Vacation Bible School. And so now I'm going to ask all of you who will be working this week in any capacity in Bible School, come forward, stand here at the front facing me, please. Everyone. Teachers, helpers, craftspeople, security team, kitchen help, everybody. Just come forward, please, because this is such a meaningful time for you, for our church family, and for so many others here in our community. There may be a few who are unable to be with us today, but just look. Look at this large team of folks who are willing to give of themselves their time, their effort, their preparation and their hearts this week. And so to you as workers in Vacation Bible School, I would say this. This week, you will be with children and youth from Winsboro and the surrounding area, and some who've come from much farther away, at least one who came from Ohio just to be in Vacation Bible School this week. And everybody who participates will be different. Each one is a unique individual. Some frankly, will come from families that are struggling with different issues. and That's just the way life is. Some of them will come from Christian homes. Others will come from homes where they never hear about God, the church, or the Bible. Some of them are already believers, but some do not know our Savior. And so those of you who are working in Vacation Bible School have a great privilege and great responsibility to represent to all of them, not just Stephen Green Baptist Church, but Christ Himself. You don't have to know everything about the Bible. You don't have to be a great speaker. You don't have to consider yourself to be a great leader. You simply need a heart for God and a heart for sharing His love with other people. Recently, I read about a man who visited Tiffany's Jewelry Store in New York City he was shown a spectacular diamond and then many other gorgeous stones as well. But then he noticed one stone that had no luster or shine whatsoever. And he said to someone, well, this one doesn't have any beauty at all. He had a friend with him and his friend said, well, hand it to me. And he put the stone in the palm of his hand and held it there for a few minutes. When he opened his hand, the first man said, well, I can't believe it. That whole stone now gleams with all the spectacular colors of the rainbow. What did you do with it? The man said, this is an opal. It's what we call the sympathetic jewel. It only needs contact with the human hand to bring out all of its wondrous beauty. All around us are people who need the warm touch of human caring and Christ-like concern to help them to glow and become all that God intends them to be. And so, do you, as members of our Vacation Bible School team this week, promise to prayerfully let God use you to share His love and the gospel of Jesus Christ with the people you will be with this week? If you do, please say together, we so promise. Thank you, and I know that you mean that, and we appreciate, again, your commitment and faithfulness. While you're still here, I'm going to ask our congregation to stand with us now for a prayer of dedication for these and the entire VBS event. And please remain standing after the prayer for our next hymn. Heavenly Father, we don't understand why you choose ordinary people like us to do your eternal work on earth, but that's what you do. We're so grateful to be a part of that work through which you can touch and change hearts and lives. And Father, we're so humbled by that, and yet it is such a great responsibility as well as privilege. Thank you for these who have committed again to work this week in VBS. We pray your blessing upon them, watch over them, guard them and guide them. Lead them in every activity, every element, every portion of what will happen this week. And we thank you in advance for the results that will be seen this week and much later on through this Vacation Bible School. Thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, we thank you for every precious promise you have given us. Teach us that we can stand on your truth, that you will honor your word. And we thank you for the privilege of sharing that word and that truth and those promises with the lost world around us here at home and indeed to the farthest parts of the earth. Bless each gift and giver now. Use it all for your glory to share the precious good news of Jesus. This we pray in his holy name. Amen. We thank Jennifer Stilwell and the choir for leading us in worship. And if you have your Bible and would like to follow along with us, I call your attention to the Apostle Paul's words in his second letter to his young Christian friend Timothy, chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. Just before this passage, Paul has been warning Timothy about evil people who will creep into the church and imposters who seem to be believers and servants of the Lord but who can lead people astray and cause all kinds of problems. And so after those warnings, Paul writes this to Timothy. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. A pastor walked into a children's Sunday school classroom one Sunday morning and he said, who broke down the walls of Jericho? One little boy looked up and said, not me, sir. (laughs) And the pastor looked at the teacher and said, is this usual behavior in this class? The Sunday school teacher said, well, pastor, I believe he's an honest boy and I really don't think he did it. The pastor just shook his head and walked out of the room. And out in the hallway, he saw a deacon. He said, let me tell you what happened. And he told him what had just occurred. And the deacon said, well, pastor, he said, I've known the teacher and that boy for several years. And I don't think either one of them would do such a thing. The pastor was really exasperated and heartbroken by this point. He went to the minister of education. This was a big church. And he told him what had happened. The minister of education said, well, let's not make a really big issue out of this thing. He said, let's just pay for the damage and take it out of maintenance. (laughs) And he said, anyway, our insurance might even cover. The point of that is, you need to know what you believe based on the Bible. And that's what we're thinking about today. Again, tonight, one of the great events begins for us, our annual vacation Bible school. But think about the name. Right in the heart, right in the center of the name of this event is the word Bible. Because that is the center of everything that will take place this week. And in fact, it ought to be central to everything that we are and do as a church. All of our worship, all of our ministry, all of our missions and outreach, everything should be centered in Holy Scripture. And that's what Paul is talking about writing to Timothy. But I want us to shed some light on what he is really saying here. And let's see what Paul is talking about concerning the Bible. There are a few thoughts I want to share with you. And here's the first one. The Bible is unique and authoritative. Paul talks about that in verse 15 and in the first part of verse 16. He says that scripture is inspired. We're going to explore that idea. Notice, he says, it's not just inspiring, but inspired. There are a lot of writings and other things that are inspiring. I've been inspired by a lot of words before that had nothing to do with the Bible. When Abraham Lincoln stood there on that fateful day dedicating the cemetery at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, his great words in that historic address inspire all of us as Americans. During the darkest days of World War II for Great Britain, when it looked like they were on the precipice of being completely annihilated by the Nazis, who had every intention of invading England and all of Great Britain and destroying them completely, 
And England basically was standing alone against this formidable foe. One man's voice could be heard on British radio. Their prime minister, Winston Churchill. And history records that his inspiring speeches kept that nation alive and kept them resisting the Nazis and ultimately to victory. A lot of inspiring things have been spoken and written throughout history. But the Bible is inspired. The meaning of the word inspired literally is it is God breathed. The words of Scripture come from the essence of God Himself. Like the old sailing ships on the Mediterranean Sea in biblical times when their sails were filled with the winds that propelled them along, human authors of the Bible were filled with the Spirit of God. They used their own personality and words, and yet they recorded accurately the exact message that God intended to communicate. Only the Word of God reveals the gospel of Jesus Christ and the way of salvation. You can't find that information anywhere else except in Holy Scripture. No other book, no other source, no other author or anyone else. Now, I call your attention to a truly staggering statement that Paul makes in these verses. He says to Timothy and to all of us, All Scripture is inspired by God. Now that probably doesn't have the impact upon us that it ought to. Because think about the time element here. Paul is referring, when he says all scripture, he is referring to the Old Testament as we know it. There was no New Testament yet. Now we all agree that the New Testament provides a clear road map to heaven through Jesus. But Paul is reminding all of us that when you look at the first 39 books of our Bible, what we call the Old Testament, from Genesis to Malachi, in all those chapters and books, in all those verses, in all those words, the focus is also on Christ. Jesus is the main subject of the entire Bible, though His name is not specifically mentioned in Old Testament Scripture. But you see, Paul is reminding us that you can trust the Bible. You can accept it as completely true. Now let's think more about this. One day Jesus was teaching and he quoted a passage from the book of Psalms. Jesus quoted scripture. And he said there that David, whom he was quoting from Psalms, was speaking through the Spirit of God. Jesus understood that the Old Testament scriptures were inspired and given by God. But then... We have to move beyond the Old Testament. Think about those earliest Christians, those in Paul and Timothy's day. Whenever they thought of Scripture, that for them included not only the Old Testament, but also the words, listen, the words of believers who had seen the risen Jesus and close associates of those eyewitnesses. The whole New Testament, every book, is written by someone who either saw Jesus after he rose from the dead or a close associate of him, them. For example, Matthew and John were original disciples of Jesus, two of the twelve. Mark and Luke were not. A lot of Christians don't even know that. Mark and Luke were not among the original twelve disciples. But Mark was a close associate of Simon Peter. In fact, as we have seen before, the early church in Jerusalem actually met in the home of John Mark and his mother there in Jerusalem. And so they heard Peter and others of the original twelve talking about their experience with Jesus, what he said and what he did, and so forth. And then Luke was not one of the original twelve. He did not personally witness the resurrection of Jesus, but he was a very close companion and ministry associate of the Apostle Paul, who is the human author of our text. In fact, Luke was the one who wrote the book of Acts as we know it. He was a medical doctor, but he was a traveling companion and fellow missionary with the Apostle Paul, who had met Jesus after his resurrection on the road to Damascus. And so even while New Testament books were being written, as is the case here, they already, for those believers, had the same authority as the Old Testament. 
You can trust the Bible. You can have confidence in it. The psalmist wrote, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Forever. And then Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Early in his evangelistic ministry, Billy Graham was criticized by some people who knew him because they told him his preaching was too simplistic. Just preaching what the Bible has to say. That's not scholarly enough, they said. Well, Billy wanted to be in touch with those who were listening to him. He wanted to be contemporary, and so he struggled with that for a while. <coughs> he prayed about it, but he finally came to the decision. And this is what he said. Now, I'm paraphrasing his prayer, but in his prayer early in his ministry, Billy Graham prayed something like this. Lord, I don't understand everything that's in this book, but I believe that this is your word. I'm going to accept it as such, and I'm going to proclaim it as such if you can use me in doing so. And he said that is what gave him the confidence to continue with that worldwide ministry of proclaiming the gospel. And listen, long ago, like other pastors, I made that choice and decision too. I preach this book because I am convinced of what it says and what it says about itself as it does in this passage of Scripture. Listen, the pulpit is no place for opinions. And if you ever hear me spouting my personal opinions here instead of the truth of God's Word, call me on it because that is not correct, that is improper. No one who tries to speak for God should ever just share his or her opinions and feelings about things. A pastor's opinions are no more important or more valid than yours. The pulpit is no place for that. Listen, I believe with all my heart that about 2,000 years ago a baby was born in a cattle stall in a little town called Bethlehem. And that baby had no earthly father. He grew up and he began preaching and teaching all across the countryside. He performed miracles of all sorts and types. And then he died on a cross for our sins, not because of any wrong he had committed. He gave his life there as a sacrifice for us. He died. His body was buried. Two days later, he stepped out of that tomb victorious over sin and death. Not long after, he returned to heaven. But he's waiting there to come back again. I firmly believe that with all of my heart, not just because I'm a preacher, but I believe that because this book says so. And I have made the decision to trust what God has to say here. And we can stake our future and indeed our eternal destiny on what God says. The Bible is unique and authoritative. But then too, as Paul reminds us, the Bible has power to change lives. He talks about that in the second part of verse 16. Now I want you to think about power for a moment. Um, I have a vacuum cleaner over here to use as sort of an object lesson, and some people have tried to put it away because they thought it was just cluttering up the building. Uh, <laughs> they did a lot of work here uh, Thursday and Friday and yesterday decorating and then cleaning after themselves. And so uh, there was a vacuum cleaner here. The other one, it was already removed. And I put this one out this morning, and uh, somebody, some good Samaritan, came along and removed it. But it's back, so we're thankful for that. But let's suppose that I wanted to vacuum this entire room. And let's suppose the only source of power is right up here at the front. Uh, I have vacuumed here a few times, by the way. Uh, but let's suppose the cord on the vacuum cleaner doesn't reach every distant part of this room. I've got a dilemma, but not really, because we can have a vacuum cleaner extension cord. Now, I can try all day turning this thing on if it's not plugged in, to a source of power. It's not going to work. It's not going to clean up anything. But if I take my extension cord and attach it here, then you know that I can use it. There you go. It's already working. Y'all, excuse me, I'll just do some house cleaning. <laughs> it's working. Very simple illustration. 
thank you for returning it, by the way. I appreciate that. <laughs> but if I wanted to get the work done and the cord on the vacuum cleaner is not long enough, I'm not going to have a source of power. It's got to be connected to that source of power. And in that case, that's what the extension cord provided. Well, think with me in one sense. The Bible is sort of like God's extension cord for all of us because He is the source of power. And He connects to us through His Holy Word, the Bible. He channels His power into all of our lives through the written Word of Holy Scripture. And when a person decides to believe the Bible, his or her life is changed. That's the greatest proof, in fact, that the Bible is true. The changed lives of people who believe it and live it. Now, Paul describes the power of the Word of God in these verses. He says, it is profitable for several things. He says to Timothy and to us, Holy Scripture is profitable for teaching. It instructs us in the truth. You hear all kind of messages in the world in which we live today. All kind of information. We're bombarded with information. We hear it, see it in our personal lives, the internet, everything else. Listen, there's all kind of information out there, but the Bible instructs us in truth, teaching. It is also profitable for reproof. In other words, when somebody that is teaching something that is false and contrary to God's truth, then reproof means it rebukes that false doctrine. But Paul says, Scripture is also profitable for correction. Whenever a person is headed in the wrong direction in his or her life, the person is corrected by Scripture. And the Bible can set him or her on the right path if that person is willing to do so. Paul says, Scripture is profitable for training in righteousness. Someone described this or defined this as constructive education in the Christian life. Now we know that the word disciple literally means a student or a learner, a pupil like in a school. And so the Bible, if we are Christ's pupils and students, the Bible provides higher education of the greatest order. Power, power to change lives. Thinking about that, I read about a man who was an atheist. And he despised everything that had anything to do with God. In fact, his hatred for God and religion were so great that he went to a bookstore and bought a New Testament. Not so he could read it, but so he could destroy it. And so he took the New Testament home to burn it. When he got home, he started a fire in his fireplace. And he threw the New Testament into the flames. But it didn't burn. And so he reached in, he opened the pages a bit so that they would burn more easily. And as he opened the book, it fell open to the Sermon on the Mount. And as he threw the New Testament back into the fire, the words on a page there caught his attention. He pulled the book back out of the flames and started reading from the Sermon on the Mount. And as the story goes, he kept reading for several hours all through the night. And then just as the sun was rising the next morning, that man stood up alone in his room and said, I believe, because of what he had read in Scripture. And then, one of the most amazing stories, true stories about the power of the Bible to change a life, comes from communist Russia years ago. There was a Russian theater, live theater, and there, one of the most usual actors was one of the most famous Russian actors, a man named Alexander Rostovzev. Now pay attention to this, because this particular actor on the Russian stage in communist Russia was actually converted to Christianity while he was playing the role of Jesus in a sacrilegious play called Christ in a Tuxedo. Mocking Jesus and the Bible. He was a leading character in that live play. He was supposed to read two verses also from the Sermon on the Mount. Then he was supposed to tear off his biblical gown and shout, Give me my tuxedo and top hat. 
mocking Jesus. That's not the way it went that night. As he read the words in the script, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. He began to tremble right there on the stage. And instead of following the rest of the script, he kept on reading from that part of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Even though his fellow actors off on the side of the stage were whispering to him, get back to the script. They were coughing and doing everything they could do to get his attention, but to no avail. He kept on reading. Finally, he recalled a verse that he had learned as a little boy in a Russian Orthodox church. And he shouted that verse there on the stage that night. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the story goes that before the curtain was lowered that night, Rostov Zev had trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. Listen, the Bible is powerful. So it is unique and authoritative, and it has the power to change lives. But the other thing Paul reminds us of is this. The Bible is sufficient. He talks about that in verse 17 that I read. Sufficient. In other words, the Bible is all that's needed in order to complete us in Jesus Christ. Now, if that's true, if the Bible is all that we need to guide us in this life and to lead us toward Christ-likeness, becoming more like the Savior, if it is sufficient, I want to ask you a pointed and personal question. How important is the Bible to you? Really, seriously, how important? The Barna Research Group does a lot of surveying and polling about religious life in America. And recently, the Barna Research Group conducted a survey among adults in the United States. The results show that many Americans have very little knowledge of the Bible at all. Among Christians in the survey, Christians, 61% knew that Jonah is a book of the Bible. 39% of Christians did not know that. 75% of those Christians knew that the book of Isaiah was in the Old Testament. 25% of Christians did not know that. And only, listen to this, only 7 out of 10 Christians who were surveyed knew where Jesus was born. They never heard the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Makes you wonder. So what is the reason for so much ignorance of the Bible. Barna's group determined it has to be a lack of reading the Bible simply. The survey also found that only 17% of all Christians said they read some of the Bible every day, while another 18% read it three to six days a week. 37% of Christians responding said they read the Bible once or twice a week, and 23% said they don't read the Bible at all, Christians. And among non-Christians in the survey, 70% said they don't read the Bible, period. And so the question comes up, is that because most people don't own a Bible? Well, the research says no, that's not the reason. Because 93% of all Americans own at least one Bible, and many or most own more than one. Again, how important is the Bible to you? A man named Michael Billister had a ministry of distributing Bibles in Europe many years ago. And shortly before World War II, he visited a certain small village in Poland. And he was determined to help distribute Bibles there. He only had one to offer. And so he gave a Bible to a man who lived in that village. Soon after the man got it and spent time reading it, he became a Christian. He was converted. Then he passed the Bible on to other people, and so forth. And it made its way around almost the entire village. And so it became a cycle of conversions and sharing the Bible. Until 200 people in that little village had become believers through just that one Bible. Think about it. Not long after that, Mr. Billister returned to that village, and he met with a group of Christians there, and he was scheduled to preach that morning. But before he spoke, he asked, would several of you 
just stand and quote a verse of scripture or two? One man stood up and said, maybe we misunderstood what you asked. Did you mean verses or chapters? Those villagers from that one Bible had not memorized a few select verses of Scripture, but whole chapters and books of the Bible. Thirteen of those 200 had memorized completely, word for word, the books of Matthew and Luke and half of the book of Genesis. Another person, amazingly, in that group, had memorized the entire book of Psalms, all 150 chapters. Again, how important is the Bible to you? One more story about that. There was a man in Kansas City not long ago who was seriously injured in an explosion. His face was badly disfigured, and he lost his eyesight as well as both hands. He was a new Christian. And not only the physical pain, disfigurement, and disability resulting from the explosion, but one of his biggest disappointments was now he could no longer read the Bible for himself. But then he heard about a lady in England who actually read Braille with her lips. She had no hands and no eyes. And so he hoped he might be able to do the same thing as the lady in England. So he sent from, for some books of the Bible in Braille. But then, when he tried to do what he'd heard she was able to do, read the Bible from Braille with his lips, he discovered that the nerve endings in his lips had also been destroyed in the explosion. And one day he kept trying that, and one day he brought one of the Braille pages to his lips, and his tongue just accidentally happened to touch the page. A few of those raised characters in Braille, and he could feel them with his tongue. He suddenly had the inspiration. He said, I could read the Bible using my tongue. And he did. Before long, before long, that man had read through the entire Bible, not once, but four times. How important to us. Listen, we need to get into the Bible and get the Bible into us. And put it into practice and live it. The Word of God tells us all that we need to know Christ. It tells us all that we need in order to grow spiritually into Christ's likeness. It is sufficient. And I remind you that faith is not a complicated issue. Faith simply means taking God at His Word. His Word. And then acting upon it. Believing what he says here and then living it. That is real faith. How far along in the journey of faith have you come? Upon what are you truly depending most of all for ultimate answers and things? What are you depending on to take you from this life into eternity? The Bible tells us all that we need to know about all of those things. We sang standing on the promises. That's exactly what we're talking about here. We can stand on the word of God, come what may. And listen, I've read and heard many arguments from opponents and enemies of scripture, skeptics and so forth. I understand all of that. And you're going to be hearing all kinds of things. You're going to be seeing it on television. You're going to be viewing it on the internet and everywhere else. Listen, there are all kinds of theories out there from skeptics and opponents of Scripture. You have to decide for yourself whether you're going to believe what God says and live accordingly. I close with this. David Livingston was a renowned missionary to Africa many years ago. But he was equally famous and known as an explorer. And so he trekked through parts of Africa where no white man had ever gone before and wrote about it and told about it. And when that famous missionary David Livingston started his journey across Africa, he had 73 books 
in three packs. And they all weighed about 180 pounds together. Well, they kept traveling and slogging their way through the jungles and rough terrain of Africa. And after Livingston's party had gone about 300 miles, he had to throw away some of his books because the men who were trying to carry them were just exhausted. They were collapsing from fatigue, from the weight of all of these volumes of heavy books. So he had to start discarding many of them. And so as he and his party continued on their journey, his library grew smaller and smaller until he had only one book left, and it was his Bible. Listen, don't travel through this life without God's holy word. Let him change you through the power of his inspired scriptures. That's what it's all about. And the Bible can give you new meaning and purpose and reason for living each and every day. It is the Word of God Himself. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father, we have to be honest and confess to you that too many times we have neglected to spend time in your word. We're so busy. So many things, so many situations, so many people demand our time and attention. But Father, remind us please that if we're too busy for you, if we're too busy to spend time with you, if we're too busy to open your word, and let you speak to us and empower us through it, then we're just too busy. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for this week when its truth will be shared with children and young people. And their lives will be changed. Thank you for the difference the Bible makes in our lives too. And Father, as we come to the close of this time of worship, Lead each of us to make that decision to trust your holy word and above all to trust Jesus who is the living word. Speak to our hearts just now as we wait before you. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. Our hymn of commitment is number 142. How are things between you and the God who inspired this book? Do you know him? Are you living in fellowship and relationship with Him? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Is God speaking to you about a decision concerning all of that? To receive Christ personally? To rededicate your life if you are already a Christian? Is God speaking to you about full membership in this church family? To join alongside us, all of us, in worship and ministry and serving the Lord? Whatever God is speaking to you about, this is your time and this is His time. And if you need to come for prayer for any reason, this is your opportunity as well. You do exactly what God leads you to do. We'll be singing prayerfully. Hymn number 142, please stand with us. I am so glad you joined us for worship and if you were able to share the whole service or even a, just a portion of it, we hope that God spoke to your heart. And again, we hope that the Bible will be an important part of your life. There's so many voices, so many messages that uh, clamor for our attention in the world in which we live, especially in this high-tech, fast-paced society that we live in today. But don't ever overlook nor neglect the truth of God's holy word, the Bible. 
Thank you again for joining us. And we invite you to worship with us again by television or Facebook or YouTube. Or if you live in our area and looking for a church home, we would invite you to come and worship with us Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Until we do meet again in worship, may God bless you richly. Hey, Father, we do thank you especially for this time of worship and fellowship in your house. Thank you especially that you are here with us. Thank you for speaking to hearts and touching lives today. And now, Father, I pray as we dismiss the time of worship that we'll understand the true service for you really begins beyond these doors and walls. Thank you for Jesus most of all and the Bible that teaches us about you. This is our prayer. His wonderful holy name together. Amen.